In your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 9, children ages 3 years through 5th grade that wish to go to the children's church time, you're dismissed at this time. And I have something very uh, encouraging to tell you as you give today. Be encouraged that part of your giving goes to support a ministry called the Great Exchange. This week at the University of Georgia, through the Great Exchange, over 60 people had conversations. Where's Lee DeLoach? What's 68? 64 students engaged in gospel conversations and two received Christ. Well, today, uh, we're going to go on a little journey. It's going to be an interesting ride. Uh, if you uh, are prone to dizziness, I would encourage you not to watch this little video in a moment. I got dizzy after 15 seconds. So uh, you can close your eyes and pretend you're on a roller coaster. A roller coaster uh, goes up and down and turns and all this, right? That is a little bit of what Nehemiah 9 is going to be about today. So uh, watch this to prepare you for our ride today, okay? Somebody might be able to name this roller coaster. Whoa, Jeff, where are you? What is it? It's <laughs> I thought you knew the name of it. Are y'all a little warm? Stacy, could we kick on the air? Thank you. Not to freeze us out, but how about that? Air condition on January 21st in Athens, Georgia, even though it's 35 outside. If we don't have it, it's okay, because... Many are going to, so what we're, is, is just, just kick it on when it starts, Carol, but I'll just start uh, preparing everybody for Nehemiah 9. Um, this, is an, this is a chapter that reveals God's nature. And I believe one of the most important things whenever you study God's word is to understand God's nature. Because if you understand God appropriately, then you can respond appropriately. But if you don't understand him properly, you will respond inappropriately. I can't even watch this. I don't know if it's 57 or what, I just... You may have to hand out those bags like they have on the plane. Jennifer's loving this. <laughs> you okay, Judy? No? Okay, I didn't think so. Bathrooms are back there, everybody. Oh. Alright, that's enough. Poor transition for all you that are seeking to be preachers, so this is not the way you do it. Friday was my mother's memorial service, <laughs> and uh, it was actually a blessed experience and some amazing testimonies that I'd never heard about my mom. And uh, one of the things that was interesting about that, which is true of any memorial service, is, you know, you're looking back over a person's life, and you're seeing things, and, and either you say, man, I want to be more like Jesus because of that person, and they're positives, or you look back on that person and you say, I want to be more like Jesus because that person really messed up in a lot of ways and I don't want to be like them. Thankfully with my mom, it was the former, that it was looking back and saying, man, that was, there's more positive there than I ever realized when I heard these testimonies. Well, Nehemiah 9 is a little bit like that in that it, it's an amazing recount of Israel's history. And Israel's history, much like I preached this summer when we did Psalm 106 and 107, the Psalms of History, Israel has this history of God moving, they fall. They cry out, he forgives, he does amazing works of provision and power, they fall. They sin, they rebel, they turn, they go to idols. He forgives, he's merciful, he's gracious, he's loving, he's patient, they fall. 
He's gracious. They fall. He's merciful. They fall. He's faithful. And on and on and on. It's this amazing journey. You may remember I had the ladder up here. Well, today, Nehemiah 9 is much like that. We are going to learn today some amazing attributes of our God that I pray with all my heart that as you learn and hear this, you will say, that's the God I want to serve. That's the God I want to love. That's the God I want to obey. Because if you come out of a message like today where you learn about God's amazing grace and faithfulness and mercy and long-suffering, if you look at that and you go, I'm going to continue to live for me, I don't want anything to do with that God, I say this with all love and affection and tenderness, you need to have your head examined. <laughs> I mean, I, I really don't say that in a belittling way. But, but I'm convinced, A.W. Tozer said once, the, the most important thing about a person is what do they think of when they think of God? What is your view of God? Is it biblically accurate? Do you have a biblically inaccurate view of God, and thus you are holding back from full surrender to a God that may not even exist. Do you know who He is? Do you have an accurate view of His nature? And as I go through this chapter, even though there would be so much in here that would make you think that God would be mad, I see more that He is sad. Now, there are times in the Bible when He is mad. There are certainly times when he expresses his full wrath and anger. But more often than not, he is sad. He's a compassionate father that longs to have intimacy with his people that he's created. And yet when we refuse it, it grieves his father heart. And he reaches out with compassion and he has offers us forgiveness if we will but repent. So in Nehemiah chapter 9, some of the parts of this chapter I'll summarize quickly. You might want to write notes in the margin. Basically, that heavy part that's blank on your notes today, that's intentional because we're going to do a little up and down graph. That's for you to write that in if you care to. And then those five points, they don't come in until the very end, so you can just sit back, listen to this, pretend you're on a roller coaster ride as we recount a lot of Israel's history. I'm going to go kind of fast for this first part. And then uh, beginning when we get to around verse 25, we'll actually read every verse from 25 on. But the first section, we're just going to summarize. So in Nehemiah 9, verses 1 to 5, as I said earlier, it's a solemn assembly. Remember Nehemiah 8 last week? We talked about how they had restored the Word of God to its proper place. They had read the scriptures for hours on end. They said amen. The scriptures convicted them of how much they had fallen from the Lord. And so remember, this is a book about rebuilding a wall, but more important, it's about rebuilding the kingdom of God and rebuilding lives. So the bricks here represent this rebuilding of the wall. They've done that. They've finished that. Now it's about rebuilding the kingdom, rebuilding the people, establishing a people who will be fully yielded to God. And in Nehemiah 8, last week, we learned of the supremacy of God's word. How important it is, if you're going to rebuild your life, if you're going to be a kingdom person, you've got to be rooted in the Word of God. One of the things that happens when you get into God's Word is you begin to discover how far short you fall to His righteousness and to His holiness. So you are convicted. You see your sin before God. And that's what happens in the first five verses of this chapter. They have this solemn assembly. They confess their sins. They confess the sins of their nation, which is much like us confessing the sin of abortion in America. And God, they cry out with a loud voice, verse 4. And then they go into a prayer. At the end of verse 5 and beginning of verse 6, it's the longest recorded prayer in the Bible. The longest recorded prayer in the Bible is right here in Nehemiah 9. They begin with praise at the end of verse 5. That's a great way to start your prayer time always, is in praise to God, acknowledging his character, acknowledging his worthiness. Then in verses 6 is where we pick up, and it begins to acknowledge that God is creator. He's the creator of the universe. Verse 7, it speaks of the Abrahamic covenant. Verse 8, it says they found Abraham's heart faithful. And then the promise of the Holy Land. Verses 9 and 10 speaks of him delivering Israel from the Egyptian slavery. He saw their affliction. He heard their cry. I love that. He saw and he heard. God sees your pain and he hears your cry. 
He sees your pain. He sees your hurt. He sees your addiction. He sees the problems in your home. He sees the struggles you have. He sees it, and he hears when you cry out to him. Oh, isn't it great to have a God who sees and hears? He hears your cry. He hears your pain. He is full of compassion. He is the most loving father imaginable. Regardless of what your earthly father was like, even if you had a great earthly father, your earthly father is nothing compared to our great heavenly father who sees all and hears all and has a big old heart. And so he delivers them. It talks about in verse 9 and 10, he delivers them out of slavery and bondage. He does signs and wonders, acts of power. You think about the plagues and all that he did to deliver his people. It didn't happen overnight, did it? They could have easily gotten impatient, couldn't they? But he delivered them. And so they're recounting these historical acts that God has done. Verse 11, he parts the Red Sea to bring his people to the other side, and he drowns the enemy. See there, his justice, his judgment did fall. It fell on the enemies. Praise God it did. He drowns them in the sea. Verse 12, he goes into that period in the wilderness where God led them with a cloud by day and a fire by night. Hallelujah. Man, God's good, isn't he? He led his people. We're reminded it was 40 years in the wilderness, but he faithfully provided. Verses 13 and 14, he gave them the Ten Commandments and other laws through Moses. Verse 15, God fed them with bread and water, and he led them into the promised land. And so this first slide, you see, he's a God of power, people, and provision. That would summarize, really, the first 15 verses. Then verses 16, we come to that word that I've said when you read Scripture. It is a very significant word of contrast, but. But they and our fathers acted presumptuously, and they stiffened their neck and did not obey your commandments. They refused to obey and were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them. So you go down, stubbornness and sin. But very quickly, there's another but. And this is a but of contrast about God's faithfulness. But they stiffened their neck and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. Oh, and sorry, this one. But you are a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and you did not forsake them. Isn't that good news? And so these buts are so important. People of Israel stiffen their neck, rebelled, and were obstinate. But God is still faithful. He is merciful. He is abounding in love, covenant, chesed in the Hebrew, covenant love, chesed love, and he does not forsake his people. If you're truly a child of God, you cannot lose your salvation. He's a covenant-keeping God. And so just to summarize, then in verse 18, they made a golden calf, idolatry. Verse 19, but in his great mercies, he led them. So we go right back up in verse, eight, in verse 19. God of faithfulness, mercy. He gave his good spirit to instruct. What a great passage. He gave them manna. He gave them water. Forty years he provided. Verse 22, he gave them kingdoms, and they possessed the land. Verse 23, he multiplied their children. Verse 24, he subdued their enemies. And now we pick up with verse 25. And they captured fortified cities and a rich land. They took possession of houses full of all good things, cisterns already hewn, vineyards, olives, orchards, and fruit trees in abundance. And then catch this, end of verse 25 is very significant. So they ate and were filled and became fat and delighted themselves in your great goodness. The implication there is they became comfortable in God's goodness. They took for granted his blessings and his grace. Boy, does that remind me of our country. We have become spiritually fat in many ways. We've become content with God's blessings on our nation. Financial prosperity is a wonderful thing but it can lead one to being comfortable in that prosperity, taking for granted that all good things come from above. Very easy, does it not, to become complacent 
and fat in a sense when we are blessed. This is why Psalm 103 says, forget none of his benefits. We must remain grateful. We must remain thankful. We must keep an attitude of gratitude. We must make the choice to rejoice. We must confess and and proclaim what Timothy says, all good things come from above. Nevertheless, verse 26, they were disobedient and rebelled and against you, and they cast your law behind their back, and they killed your prophets who had warned them in order to Turn them back to you. So these prophets were there. God sent them to warn them and turn them back. But what did they do? They killed them. We don't want to hear the message. Let's destroy the messenger because we don't like the message. You think that's being done today? When people don't like the message, they attack the messenger. And they committed great blasphemies. Therefore you gave them into the hand of their enemies consequences for sin. God will not be mocked. A man will reap what he sows. You sow to the flesh, you will reap corruption. You sow to the Spirit, you reap life and peace. So he gave them into the hand of their enemies and he made them suffer. Well, how does that jive with a loving father? Hebrews 12, he disciplines those whom he I'll never forget one of the first times that I had to spank one of my children. I think it was you, Josiah. (laughs) But it was the only time. And I cried. Parents, you've been there, haven't you? And I think it was Josiah. He said, Dad, why are you crying? I'm the one being punished. And I said, because it really does hurt me more than you. And they don't understand that, and they won't until they have their own children, will they? But then I took him in my arms, and I said, son, I love you. I love you, and and, and I'm responsible to help raise you in a way that helps you do what is right. And I bring these consequences to bear because I love you. And I want you to learn from this so that we don't have to do this again. (laughs) How much more is God that way? And he has to spiritually spank us. But then he takes us in his arms. And he says, I did that because I love you and I want you to learn from that. And I don't want you to run in the street and get hit by a car. I have boundaries for a purpose. It's for your protection. It's to provide what is best for you. Why do I say don't be unequally yoked with an unbeliever in marriage? Because I want to withhold something? No, because I want to provide for you someone better, that you'll have spiritual unity. Why do I bring about certain consequences for sexual immorality? Because I love you, and because I want to protect and provide for you something much better. And so we must understand that sin has consequences, and it's orchestrated by a loving Father who wants what is best for us. And in the time of their suffering, they cried out to you, and you heard them from heaven. So God wants to see this cried out. The consequences are designed to lead us to repentance. And so the Bible says the kindness of God leads you to repentance. There's even a kindness in his discipline. Because the intention of the discipline is that we might fully repent, be forgiven, and restored. And according to your great mercies, you gave them saviors. These were prophets, priests, and kings who saved them from the hand of their enemies. And they were all a foretaste of the one Savior who was going to come, Jesus Christ. All of this, according to Luke 24 and 44, Jesus said, all that was written in the law, the Psalms and the prophets were written about me. So these saviors in little s are all to point to the Savior, Jesus, who was going to come and forgive in a totally deeper way than ever, one sacrifice for all, and give us the indwelling Holy Spirit that we might have the power to obey. They didn't have that. They didn't have the indwelling Spirit. Verse 28, but, another word of contrast, after they had rest, once again became comfortable in blessings, they did evil again before you. Note that word again. 
and you abandoned them to the hand of their enemies, consequences again, so that they had dominion over them. Yet, another word of contrast, when they turned and cried to you, you heard from heaven, and many times, circle that, many times you delivered them according to your mercies. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, are you catching this? Mm-mm-mm. Mercy, forgiveness, faithfulness, long-suffering, patience, goodness, love. Do, do you sense a mad God here? I don't. I sense a sad God. And a God who longs for intimacy. Verse 29, and you warn them, again, his loving father heart, in order to turn them back to your law. Yet, another word of contrast, they acted presumptuously, did not obey your commandments, but sinned against your rules, which if a person does them, he'll live by them. Isn't that awesome? Right here in the middle, it says, if you'll just live by his law, you'll be blessed. Can't you see? He's always reaching out saying, if you'll just obey, if you'll sow to the Spirit, you'll reap life and peace. Your life can be so much better. Why do you continue to go down a path that's only going to lead to destruction? When will you learn? And they turned a stubborn shoulder, stiffened their neck, and would not obey. Verse 30, many years you bore with them. Love that word. You bore with them. Can you not see the emotional language here, beloved? God bore with his people, staying in the trenches with them, longing to forgive, longing to show mercy. And he warned them by your spirit through your prophets. There is a great verse or phrase describing the inspiration of Scripture. God speaking through prophets, but ultimately it being the Holy Spirit. Prophet speaking, but it being through the Spirit. 2 Timothy 3 and 16, God breathed. All Scripture is God breathed. So here's God warning through the prophets by His Spirit. Yet, another contrast, they would not give ear. God speaking, God imploring, yet they would not give ear. Maybe some of you, that describes your life today. You're not giving ear. God is speaking to you in this message. God was speaking to you yesterday in something that happened. God has been speaking to you through people that he's put in your life that have been warning you and lovingly bringing things to your attention. God lovingly is trying to get your attention through your spouse or through your child or through your parents. But you would not give ear. Therefore, you gave them into the hand of the peoples of the lands. Once again, consequences. Nevertheless, <laughs> these words of contrast, but yet, yeah, nevertheless, in your great mercies, you did not make an end of them or forsake them because you are a gracious and merciful God. He did not bring an end to them. He did not cast them aside. He did not say, you've blown it so much, I'm forever done with you. He will never do that if you're his child. He perseveres. He loves you. He puts people in your life. He brings circumstances to bear. His Holy Spirit is nudging you and convicting you that you might turn. If you're in Christ, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. He will never take his spirit from you. That spirit that is within you is the one who is stirring and seeking to bring to your attention your waywardness. If you sin repeatedly and you do not experience the conviction of God, then it might be that you're not truly saved. Because Hebrews 12 says he disciplines those whom he loves. If you are without discipline, you are an illegitimate child and not a true son. Verse 32. Now therefore our God, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love. Again, recounting his nature. Let not all the hardships seem little to you that has come upon us, upon our kings, our princes, our priests, our prophets, our fathers, and all your people. 
since the time of the kings of Assyria until this day, yet you have been righteous. Now this verse is very important. You have been righteous in all that has come upon us. In other words, God is fully righteous in bringing these consequences to bear. He is fully justified in his judgment. These hardships are consistent with his nature, bringing to bear upon his people certain things for their waywardness. For because you have dealt faithfully, we have acted wickedly. What a great prayer. Acknowledging that this has happened because of our sin. You've been faithful to do this. You're consistent with who you truly are. This is all consistent with your nature because he is holy and loving. Our kings, our princes, our priests, and our fathers have not kept your law or paid attention to your commandments and your warnings that you gave them. Even in their own kingdoms and amid your great goodness that you gave them, and in the large and rich land that you set before them, they did not serve you or turn from their wicked works. Verse 36, Behold, we are slaves this day in the land that you gave to our fathers to enjoy its fruit and its good gifts. Behold, we are slaves, and its rich yield goes to the kings whom you set over us because of our sins. They rule over our bodies and over our livestock as they please, and we are in great distress. Wow. Acknowledging that we're in pain, we're in a big heap of mess, and it's our own fault. Verse 36. Is that the last verse? My eyes are playing tricks. Eight. Is that eight or six? Eight, thank you. Because of all this, all this up and down we've seen, we make a firm covenant in writing. On the sealed documents are the names of our princes, our Levites, and our priests. Next week, chapter 10, we will see exactly what was in that writing. We will examine the commitment they were making in writing. So they pray this longest prayer recorded in Scripture. They go through, let's look at that summary graph. They go through this amazing recount of all the ups and downs and how God was faithful and merciful through it all. And at the end, they say, now it's serious commitment time. How can we not make a firm commitment to our God in writing based upon our history? And so next week, we'll look at exactly the five things that were in that prayer, that commitment they made. But let me just say this as we again look at this chapter. Five lessons that I draw from this. Number one, God is powerful and personal and wants to do great things in our lives. God is powerful. He's the creator God. He's almighty. We have worshipped him for his greatness today. Love our worship today. All God-centered, Jesus-exalting, singing to him. We exalt you, Lord. You are worthy. You are worthy. No name greater or more beautiful than the name of Jesus. We worship you, God. He is wanting to work in your life, just as he did in Israel. I was sharing with Rich this week. We had a great time at my house, and I was giving him a little summary of the message, and he goes, wow, that, that just sounds like kind of all of history. Not just Israel's history, but kind of like the rest of the Old Testament and the New Testament and Jesus and his disciples and church history. <laughs> Isn't it? But your life doesn't have to be it can be, get it? We're going to all fall. We're going to all fall short. We all blow it. Talking to my brother this week, it was awesome. He talking about this ministry they have at their church, much like our Fresh Wind ministry. And, and it's called, um, what was the term he used, Rich, about the wounded warriors? Not wounded warriors, but ah, uh, blood-stained allies. Thank you, Lord. And they emphasize with their men, and I pray we do this here, is we don't expect perfection. I'm not. I blow it every week. I have impure thoughts. I have impure motives. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm impatient with my children, with my wife. The Christian life is not about 
being perfect. <laughs> the good news is good news because it's grace when, not if, we fall short. <laughs> what God wants is integrity, honesty, come clean, be real. And they have this ministry, blood-stained allies, where guys, it's okay to say, now listen close, it's not okay to look at porn. That's not what I'm saying. But it's okay to say, I blew it this week in looking at porn. Please help me. I want to repent of that. I don't want to be in bondage to that anymore. That's what we're talking about. A place where, just like with God, it's okay to be honest and get out all your junk. We need to be a church and a people where we extend grace to one another when they do confess their sin and they do say, I've fallen short, and they do say, I'm struggling. Now, if somebody says, I just had an affair and I'm loving it and I don't want to repent, that's when judgment comes. That's when truth trumps grace. God's always about truth and grace, but when a person refuses to repent, when they're pharisaical, when they're hypocritical, when they pretend they're doing great and they're not, and they put on this face, that's when truth goes a little stronger than grace. But when a person repents, woman caught in adultery, and says, I need help, and I'm going to come clean, then grace trumps truth. James says, mercy triumphs over judgment. Second point, God is gracious and merciful to forgive us when we sin and repent. Even though he knows we're going to sin again. He's always true to 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. He will forgive us all of our sins and cleanse us of unrighteousness. In John 16, when it says the Holy Spirit comes to convict of sin... Then he wants to convict of righteousness. Because when he convicts of sin, that we might repent, go to the cross with it, then he bestows upon us cleansing and righteousness. So the conviction of sin is always designed to lead to repentance that you then might be convinced that in Christ you are cleansed and clean and righteous in his sight. That's the good news of the gospel. Number three. God brings consequences to bear for our sin, and it is for our own good. Those consequences are for our good. Sexual immorality can lead to getting an STD. It can result in a child born out of wedlock. Drugs and alcohol abuse can result in the loss of a job or family. Breaking of the law can result in being in jail and fines. The sin of unforgiveness can lead to bitterness and stealing your joy. The sin of abortion can lead to all kinds of post-traumatic stress disorders and things that need to be healed. And it's not just women. Any man who helped facilitate an abortion needs to repent. But you can be healed. You can be forgiven. You can be restored. You can be filled with the Holy Spirit. So, so let me show you something real quick. Consequences for sin are always designed to lead to true conviction and repentance, confession and repentance, that then you might get grace and forgiveness and love and the power of the Spirit to change. You see how that works? The consequences are never to just punish you, beat you down, shame you, make you feel horrible about it, and then you end up going, well, I'm just going to chunk it all, and a lot of people do that. That's not conviction, that's condemnation, that's from the enemy. The conviction of the Spirit is designed to lead you to a deep awareness of what you have done. The consequences is to lead you to an awareness of your sin, that you might confess and repent of that sin, that you might be forgiven at the cross of Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit in order to live more for God. That's what it's designed to do. Proverbs 28, 13, He who conceals his sin will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes it will find mercy. Proverbs 28, 13. Number four, God's heart longs for us to walk close with him. He longs for us to walk close with him. And number five, God's grace is designed to motivate us to live in obedience to him. When I uh, started pastoring the church in Wisconsin that I pastored for 18 years, my first week there, a woman came to me and said, Pastor David, I don't know what to do. 
My husband has thrown my clothes out of our house on three different occasions, trying to kick me out. I have had three Christian counselors telling me I should divorce him because of his incredibly sinful life. I don't know what to do. Over the course of the next two years, this man got in my discipleship group, and he got so dead serious about his sin and the areas of his life that were not in line with God's will, I will never forget one time he came to me. He said, we're going to need about three hours together. He came to me, and he had drawn out my three circles, spirit, soul, body, soul being your mind, will, and emotions. He had eight pages of sins and areas of his life that didn't measure up to the will of God in all three of those circles. He had things identified in his deepest inner man of the spirit. He had things identified in his mind, his will, his emotions, his physical body that were not in line with the will of God, and he, from the depth and the sincerity of his heart, began to confess those sins, invite the Holy Spirit to change those sins. He was one of the most broken men I have ever seen before God Almighty, and he wept before God. He was so dead serious about getting radically right with God. We went through the seven steps to freedom by Neil Anderson, and to this day, he is one of five people that I would say I have seen the most radical change ever in his life. Dr. Kent Summerfield, he would not mind me mentioning this. His marriage is one of the best I have ever seen to this day. He is one of the most loving people that I could point anybody to today. Why? Because he's been forgiven much, loves much. The minute you meet him, the compassion on his countenance is astounding. Because he got in touch with God's grace. He tapped into the mercy of God. And so I want to share in conclusion a diagram that I've used before, but I am convinced some of you really need to see. And it has to do with grace, this idea of grace. And before we get to the diagram, let me just say this. Romans chapter 5 says, where sin abounds, grace all the more. Okay, now you're going to have to really listen closely here. Actually, I don't mind if you call me a heretic after this because it was D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, Westminster Chapel in London, pastor there for over 20 years. He says, if you're not accused ever of being a heretic, you probably haven't preached true grace. Romans 5 says, where sin abounds, grace even more. Watch this. If you sin negative one and repent, you get positive one in terms of grace. Therefore, if you sin negative two and repent, you get positive two grace. You see where this is going. You sin positive 100, repent, you get, I mean, sin negative 100, sin, repent, you get positive 100 in grace. Woo! Then you're going to go, I'm going to sin more to get more grace. Well, that's exactly what Paul said in Romans 6 after he said, where sin abounds, grace all the more. But then he says, may it never be. Listen closely. If you never consider abusing grace, then you don't fully understand it. But if you do abuse grace, then you don't fully appreciate it. If you don't consider abusing grace, well, man, I'm going to send negative three so I can get positive three in, in, in grace. If you don't consider that, then you don't truly understand it because it is that good. But if you do abuse it, then you don't fully appreciate it. Say that again. Say that. <laughs> if you don't consider abusing grace, then you don't fully understand it. Because it really is that good. It really is that good. Kent Summerfield understands grace a huge amount because his life was such a wreck. But if you talk to Kent and say, hey, Kent, why don't you go back to your old life so you can get more grace? He'd go, may it never be. I love Jesus so much now because of what he's done in my life. I just want to live for Jesus. I love Jesus. I want to obey Jesus, not in some legalistic thing, but because of how much he's done for me. So if you don't consider abusing it, you don't fully understand it. But if you do abuse it, then you don't fully appreciate it. 
Diagram, please. The more we become aware of God's holiness, the more we become aware of our sin. Before I was saved, I understood that adultery was wrong, but once I got saved, I understood that lustful thoughts were also sin. So you're like, man, this is tough. Before I got saved, I understood that murder was sin, but after I got saved and read the Sermon on the Mount, I realized that having unrighteous anger toward a person, that's just as, as much sin before God as murder, because I'm murdering them in my heart. So it can be a little overwhelming, it can it not? Because when you get saved, you think, well, I'm going to be better, right? And then all of a sudden you feel like I'm being worse. Because now I'm getting convicted not only of, of, of just actions, but motives and thoughts. And so if, if you go down the trail of just seeing your sin, it'll lead to despair. But what God wants and what the gospel offers us and what Nehemiah 9 offers us today is this. Every time you are aware of your sin in light of the holiness of God, have it drive you to the cross. Have it drive you to the beauty of the gospel. Have it cause you to appreciate at a deeper level than you ever have how good this news really is that he forgives all sin over and over and over. And it can be the hundredth time you've confessed the same sin. He will still forgive. He is full of mercy and compassion. And so what happens is the cross and the gospel gets bigger and bigger and bigger. You appreciate more and more and more the grace of God and what Jesus did for you and the Holy Spirit who indwells you because now you have something they didn't have. They didn't have the indwelling Holy Spirit. We do. That's why Hebrews says it's a better covenant, a better sacrifice. It's fuller. It's deeper. It goes into your very spirit where when you get saved, you get the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit in you is more powerful than any sin, addiction, struggle that you could ever face. Will we still fall? Yes. But every time we do, let it drive us to the cross of Jesus Christ where we receive mercy and grace to help in time of need, and we say, oh God, fill me afresh with your Holy Spirit. Let me close with these verses. Just reinforcing all that we've said today. Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. He rises to show you compassion. Romans 5. Where sin abounds, grace all the more. Shall we sin that grace may increase? May it never be. See? There's, there it is right there. Romans 10. But of Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. You see the heart and the mercy and the emotion of God there? And then Titus 2. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It, grace, teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Let's just take a couple questions, maybe. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time, but uh, I do want to take a few questions. So if our guys, thank you. One over here already, and then I'll kind of wrap this up and lead I us in. It. I got a quick question while I'm on the move. Yes, sir. Um, since we were talking about um, consequences uh, drive us to repent and turn to God, how do we regard God's permanent consequences on, on people? How do we process through that? Um, an example of like Moses not being allowed in yeah. the promised land, yet he's still clearly God's people. Absolutely. Great question. I think there are some consequences that are more serious than others. You know, you murder somebody. You may spend the rest of your life in jail. And, but God can meet you in jail. <laughs> Whereas just an impure thought, you know, sin is sin, but some have greater consequences. So if somebody actually commits adultery, it may cost them their marriage. A lustful thought that they quickly take captive and, you know, take every thought captive, you know, and it's a fleeting thing, but they quickly, that, that, the consequences of that are not near as great as actually a full-blown actual affair. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Now, if this isn't taken captive, it can lead to all kinds of other stuff that could be just as serious. So I think that's just showing that certain sins have greater consequences. Sarah? You mentioned that um, the people in the Old Testament didn't have the Holy Spirit indwelling them. Um, but chapter 9, verse 20 says, you gave your good spirit to instruct them. Can you clarify yeah. that? Yeah. He gave his good spirit to instruct them. That doesn't mean he's indwelling them. 
This is why in Psalm 51, when David had sinned and he says, take not your Holy Spirit from me, some people use that to say you can lose your salvation. No. He was saying, take not your anointing from me. Take not your active presence from me. In the Old Testament, the Spirit would move from person to person and situation to situation. It was more of a Spirit coming upon someone, never an indwelling their spirit. And Hebrews makes that very clear when it talks about how the, co the new covenant is better than the old. It was all a shadow and a foretelling, but the new covenant and what happened at Pentecost was radically different because now God was going to come and take up residence within their spirit. So he was working, but he wasn't indwelling them. Great question. Hey, Pastor, can you talk about progressive sanctification? Yes. Um, I know that with what you were talking about, I know that you believe this, but you were kind of talking about how, you know, obviously we sin, we receive grace, but, I, you know, talk about maybe progressive sanctification and how there is a possibility of victory slash obedience over sin. Yeah. So if we can go back to the diagram, please, Carol. Progressive sanctification. Justification is what happens the moment you're saved. That's where that first cross is. When you receive Christ, you are justified by faith, Romans 5 and 1. You are declared righteous before God in your spirit, okay, spirit, soul, body. Your spirit is made clean. You're called a saint. You are promised eternal life. You are justified, declared righteous before God. That's the first step of what we call salvation. Second is sanctification. That's the process whereby you are growing in maturity. You are growing in surrender. That's the rest of this diagram where in sanctification, you are becoming more and more like Jesus. The third element of salvation is glorification, where you go to be with God. My mother is now glorified in that she is in the presence of Jesus. She will, at some point in the future when Christ returns, receive her glorified body, but her spirit is with Jesus right now. So salvation is justification, sanctification, and glorification. And sanctification is the process where we're all in it right now, growing into Christ-likeness, getting to know God better, learning how to love Him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, repenting when we sin, magnifying the cross of Jesus, sharing Christ with others, bearing fruit for His glory. All of that is involved in sanctification. And you can progress in sanctification to the degree that you love and obey God. If you don't love and obey God, then your sanctification is a bit sabotaged. You will regress. You will drift. Hebrews says don't drift. You will slip back, called backsliding. God never leaves you. You're still his child. He will discipline you to come back. And so my desire today is that this kind of a passage will motivate us to say, God, I want, to, I want my sanctification to be increased. I want my love for you to be increased. I want my obedience to you to be increased. I don't want to slip back. I don't want to drift. I don't want to fall away. If I do, God, bring me back quickly. I want to repent. I want to be close to you. I want to be as Christ-like as you will allow me to be. That pleases God. That's what he wants from his people. Yes, sir. Um, uh, since we are so sinful, how do we uh, discern like, bad or tough things going on in our life and whether they are due to God disciplining us or whether it's just a test or him guiding us? I think you just ask the Lord, ask trusted brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, he'll show you. You know, some things are his discipline. Some things are just the normal trials and tribulations of life. Some are testing. I gave a whole message about a year ago on the testing of the Lord. It's going to be a chapter in my new book. So there are some things that God intentionally brings in our life to test us. Joseph, Genesis 38 to 50, test, 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 test. He passed, he passed, he passed, he passed. He was elevated, saved many lives. Um, so it's, it depends. I think the first thing to do is say, God, is there anything in my life that you're trying to correct here? Is this happening because you're trying to show me something that maybe needs to be fully, more fully yielded? Or if there's, if there's a, remember in Psalm, I think it's Psalm 51, he says, even show me my um, hidden sins. So it was like, hey, man, I want to go so deep with you, God, that you even show me stuff that I've never seen before, and you're showing me because I'm really getting more serious about you. I'm fasting, I'm praying, spending extra time with you, and he starts just exposing things you would have never seen otherwise. Man, that will elevate your sanctification when you do that kind of seeking God. So it depends. All right, we're out of time. Up, oh, one more. Praise the Lord, everybody. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Worship.
worship the Lord because he's worthy. Amen. We worship. Guilty as charged. <laughs> I, my son got married. I, beautiful big wedding. I was drinking champagne. I just had a ball. But God convicted me after that, <laughs> saying, you start in the spirit, don't end in the flesh. Ooh. That means don't, don't go crazy. Mm. You know, don't come back to me. And I mean, in scripture, he gave me, first he whipped me, mm. then he loved me with scripture, how he died for me and gave me the spirit to keep me and mm. for to come back. And since then, it been like falling in love all mm. over again. He won't let you go. He's going to keep you. Thank you. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Jerry. What a great way to conclude it. That just summarized everything we've said. She said it in two minutes. Why did it take me 45? <laughs> well, Father, we thank you. We love you. Lord, we just exalt you. You're a great God. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Lord, help us love you because you first loved us. Help us forgive because you forgave us. Help us be gracious and merciful to others because you've been gracious and merciful to others. Help us be patient with others and ourselves <laughs> because you've been patient with us. Help us never take for granted, never make light of your grace, never abuse your grace, never say, well, I'm going to sin because I can just come back and get forgiven. Lord, we just trust you to convict. We trust you to do the work. We trust you to show us where we mess up. And God, I pray that your grace and your love and your mercy and all that we've learned today would bring great healing and liberty and, and just cleansing today. Lord, those that are in sin, those that need to confess, those that need to run to the cross, oh God, would you give them grace to do that today? We trust you now with this response time. Let nothing be unfinished that you want to do in this room today. So have your way. Holy Spirit, be released. Oh God, would you grant salvation to any here that are not saved? They don't have Jesus in their life. Might they cry out to you and receive you in their life today. We trust you with the fruit of this message. In Jesus' name. If we could have our prayer teams along the side, please. I'd like us to stand. The altar's opened is to come and pray. If you want to pray with somebody, there's people along the sides. I just encourage you, make sure that you give some time. Maybe close your eyes right now. Well, what is it that God would have you do with what you've heard today? What is he saying to you? Well, what is your application? I don't even pretend to know what that might be. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would show every person here very clearly how you want them to respond, whether it's confession, repentance, surrender, just praise, worship, getting prayer, Lord, have your way. We love you. We love you, Lord. Mm -hmm.